Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Billy Murphy. Billy Murphy is the founder of BlueFirePoker.com. It's an online training for poker players. That it did six figures its first week, went on to generate millions of dollars. And he also, he scaled up 20 e-commerce stores in under a year. The best part is they were hands-free. And after he set them up, he didn't, he didn't even need to log into the account, which I was surprised about. He pretty much outsourced the whole thing. And Billy teaches people just that with his training site, Ecom Lab. Billy, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. So, you know, we often learn our most valuable lessons when we make mistakes. So I'm excited to hear your take, your big lessons learned, your big mistakes that you've made along this journey running e-commerce stores. So we don't obviously have to make the same ones. Um, I always like to include a fun fact and you're such a calculated guy. So this is a perfect fun fact, which is Billy set a goal last year to get in shape. And really he, what he wanted to do is look like one of those chiseled guys from 300. So what he did in, in Billy fashion, I think is he emailed 30 personal trainers in Austin and he won and he told them what exactly what he wanted. And he ended up going through and like interviewing them and he hired a world champion bodybuilder. So who measured him every week with calipers, which means not cheating with pizza, beer, burgers, all that stuff. <laughs> so from a disciplined person like that, we definitely want to hear what things didn't go perfectly on the journey. Um, what's something that you could talk about, like a mistake you made that maybe you, you couldn't have seen because of you know the internet or how Google functions with one of your e-commerce sites? Yeah, I guess the, the biggest mistake, um, one of them was uh, that we didn't basically build an authority site with e-commerce stores. Um, it was basically just uh, kind of a mathematical play that you know I could basically buy stores very cheap. Um, they were making you know a good monthly profit, and or I could start stores and basically pay people to you know do SEO for them. Um, and I knew I could rank them and make more money, you know, from selling the products uh, that I paid for the SEO. And so. You know, the problem with that strategy is I'm not I'm not selling anything different than my competitors. So basically, doing so many stores, I mean, you really, you know, if you're running 20 stores, you're definitely not focusing on any one store um, to build it into a big authority site. And so, when you don't have an authority site, it's really just a numbers game. I mean, there's no reason someone should buy from me over somebody else. So um, that was something. If I could, if I started over, um, I probably wouldn't start so many stores. I'd probably you know start one or two and and build them into a really strong authority site and um, it's just a lot easier. You create a moat around it rather than, you know, somebody basically being at the mercy of Google, you know, whatever they want to do. If, if I'm doing a bunch of, you know, 20 random dropship sites, uh, they, at any time they could just kind of wipe away my traffic. So, so what happened in one of those sites because of Google? Yeah, I mean, um, definitely got hit pretty bad when the Google updates changed. Um, you know, there were one or two major major changes with Google uh, like a year, I guess a year, year and a half ago. Um, and I mean, I think we got hit, you know, on, on a lot of the a lot of the 20 stores. But, um, uh, you know, one one example would be I bought a store for, it was like $15,000. And I think, you know, it was a good deal. I got a good deal at the time. Um, so for a couple months, you know, maybe two months, uh, I made pretty good money off of it, maybe a couple grand a month. And then basically income just shut down on the site because uh, you know it was making all its money from organic traffic so there wasn't wasn't really anything I could do because it was a dropship product so you know I didn't have all sorts of different avenues for revenue and you know it went from I don't know the exact numbers but you know maybe the month before we did you know a couple thousand in profit maybe the month after maybe we did you know a couple hundred bucks and so I just paid <laughs> 15 grand for it and so you know, it was going to take a long, long time to get the money back, you know, because of the because of how bad it got hit. And I think I think I ended up selling that, and I probably ended up losing money on that one, um, just because it got hit right after I bought it. I mean, there wasn't, you know, it's, again it goes back to the control. Like I, I didn't control it because of the fact that you know Google controlled it basically. So, um, so that was one I got got hit pretty pretty hard on. But I mean, how do you even calculate for that? I mean, do you like buy sites after the Google update? Like, how do you even, you know what I mean? You you really can't. Um, you know, I knew going in, so I, it didn't didn't hurt me too bad. You know, emotionally or financially. In fact, that like I knew going in, hey, this is a risk. Like I know, like I'm basically just. I mean, part of the reason that you know I could buy things or start so cheaply was 
because of the fact it's you know it's viewed as risky. And so you know I'm basically making you know a calculation. Hey, hey here's the risk. <clears throat> here's the risk, and basically, do you know, I want to take the risk to make this this return? And you know a lot of times it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. And that was an example of one time where you know it just it's, it's kind of like buying at the the height of a, a real estate bubble. It's it's you know, making good money. They were ranking really well, but you know the, the the next update decided, hey, this site isn't quite how we how we like it, and so it wiped away uh, the majority of the traffic. And I know you mentioned too competitive advantage, having competitive advantage. What did you see that you were trying to offer, but it wasn't quite you know good enough with uh, the com- the competition? Um, well, I mean, the m- majority of our stores were just 100 percent of them were dropship, and so. Basically, the majority of stuff we were doing it was it was unrelated products. Um, so, you know, everything from heaters to organic baby furniture, and there wasn't anything. You know, we weren't creating our own brands. It was it was basically like if you wanted to buy something on our site, you could probably find it on somebody else's site too. Um, so we had no advantage. The only the only real places you can have advantage there are, for example, like pricing. Um, you know, maybe you could have a better site design or something like that. But uh, customer service, but like very minimal things. Like I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend anybody like, hey, build a business on, you know, having a cheaper price. Like, I would never say that to anybody. Um, it, you know, rare, rare examples. Maybe it could make sense, but, um, but it's not really a competitive advantage. Um, you don't want to be competing on price. So, really, the majority of our stuff was you could find it on twenty, fifty other stores, and so there was nothing. You know, I was I was surprised a lot of times. That we were lucky to get a lot of sales that we did because you know they could have bought from the next guy or the next guy. Um, there just wasn't, you know, wasn't anything unique about what we were doing. Right. So what would you go and do differently to brand yourself? Because I'm surprised almost because I read your blog, Forever Jobless. You'll post something, there'll be like 90 comments. So like, what would you have done with these stores, or what weren't you doing? Yeah, if I if I started over today, um, I'd probably just start. You know, one or two, and I'd probably create my own brand. So, uh, because the number of reasons, one is, you know, not only do you have a bigger margin, but you also leverage the fact that a lot of other people can sell your stuff too. So, if you're a drop shipper, you you're making money on one store. Um, and yeah, there's a couple other revenue sources. I mean, you could list on Amazon, you list on eBay, but you, you're not gonna, you, you're still competing against the same thing uh, other people are selling. So. And you're on such thin margins that if you sell on Amazon, you know, then you give a cut of your small margin to Amazon. Um, it's this is not very scalable. So, and you can't really scale through very many dropship niches through uh, pay per click, for example. So, if I have a 25 percent margin and I'm, I want to do pay per click, I'm competing against suppliers and manufacturers that have you know 50, 60, 70 percent margins. So, um, you can't scale that way. Where, and that's another thing that you know, Google, it, it gives you a lot of uh, I guess more control because then you're buying the advertising and you can profitably do so. So if there's an algorithm change in Google, it's not going to change your paid advertising. So um, you know it's a little bit more secure in the fact that hey, I've got a 60% margin because I'm making my own product. Where you know if I'm doing you know 20% or 30% margins as a drop shipper, um, I'm at, I'm at the mercy of other people. So you know what if what if uh, what if my supplier says hey like we're gonna we're going to change change the deal, and now you have a lower margin. Well, th- that might put me out of business. Like maybe I can't can't make money on it anymore because maybe it costs me too much in marketing to to get more sales. And so um, you don't control much at all. And and but really the fact is, instead of selling on one store, maybe you got twenty people selling your product for you. Um, you know, you can list it on Amazon. You can list it everywhere else you could have. But now with double or more of the margin, and so um, it's just a lot easier to scale something like that. I mean, you had a lot of e-commerce stores. You have a lot of e-commerce stores. How do you decide what niches to go into? Um, it depends. If I was buying a store, I would look for, you know, I'd look for a store that maybe had something that I could easily change. So I, I didn't do any major, major changes. Um, for example, you could buy cheap stores on Flippa, and the thing is, a lot of people are running them as a as a hobby or side business. Um, you know, most of the Flippa price ranges are pretty low. Um, a lot of stuff is like under ten grand. So most of those people running, a, you know, a little ten k site is is not their main income. So um, lots of times they don't have like a phone number because they're at work during the day, or they have a phone number and it never gets answered. Um, that's an example of sales they're they're not getting. 
Uh, another thing is a lot of people just throw up a PayPal and they don't even, some people didn't have credit cards on there. So a lot of times you could just throw on easier payment method for a lot of people, uh, easier way to make sales, the phone number, <clears throat> maybe they were ranking on the second page for a lot of main terms and I said, hey, I could easily get these up to the first page. So a lot of times you could buy a site for very cheap and then literally very, very little changes um, increase the revenue quite a bit. And so, you know, if you wanted to flip one of those stores, you could you could buy it cheap, you know, increase the revenue, instantly flip it back um, and make money. Most of the time I just held on to it. But uh, um, so I just make those calculations. And in terms of starting a store from scratch, uh, I would just calculate basically the estimated traffic that was coming in in a certain niche. Um, I'd calculate, you know, what do I think uh, you know, what do I think this would cost me to rank and how hard would it be to rank? And then I would multiply the margins times the estimated traffic. Um, coming in times the spot on Google I thought I could get it to because each, uh, each spot on Google has a certain percentage of people who click through to that. So I just calculate those things out and I would say, you know, hey, I think this niche can make, you know, two grand a month or three grand a month. And then, you know, if that was what I wanted, I would, I would start if it was too low. Um, or, or I thought it was going to be too competitive. Um, I just I would go look at something else. So it was just kind of a you know I'd run a couple minutes worth of math on stuff and um, decide if it was you know just compare a lot of you know twenty random niches against each other and say okay let's do this one and this one and this one and just kind of throw them up. What was the biggest mistake you saw someone make that would make the biggest change when you actually you know made those changes? Made made changes. Yeah, and like so when you you know, looked at a site, what was something that you saw like a real common mistake that people were making with their e-commerce site that when you you knew when you took it over, you'd be like, oh, that's gonna make a huge change when I change that part of it. Um, I, I guess I would say a big, I mean, the biggest thing probably was people would sell stores where all of their keywords were just under the mark where they need to be where they they'd be on the first page. So like. You know they're ranking like eleven and thirteen for major terms, and you could tell, you know, look through their analytics and see that's where they're already making their money. So you knew that's where the money was, and they were just selling it. So they were essentially, I guess, it's similar to like, like if you were selling at the bottom of a market in the stock market or the real estate market, you don't sell then. Like you basically, you know, would 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 fix it up if it's a house, for example, get get them on the first page, get it making more money, and then sell it. And a lot of people were just. I remember one site specifically, like this guy had all his like I mean he was ranking for a lot, but all on the second, third, and fourth page. But he was making all his money off those terms. And I looked at it and it was a relatively uncompetitive niche. So um basically I was just buying, you know, either buying SEO packages from people or or having someone, you know, on Odesk do some SEO. And I don't know if it was like a month or two months, like three to four times, we, we multiplied the, the traffic on those terms by three to four times, which multiplied the income by three to four times, and it was it was not complicated. Like, again, I didn't, I wasn't doing it, I was just kind of buying packages for other people to do it, and, and he could have done the same thing at the time. Um, you know, it was just kind of a simple math equation that, hey, here's the money you're making, here's what it would, roughly what it would cost for you to rank higher, and if you rank higher, your income should increase by X. And, right. and it did, and it was, a lot of people do that, um, and I don't think they they realize how much money they're leaving on the table. Like he could have he could have then sold the site for three to four times as much if he had just you know put in a month worth of work. Yeah, that's a good one. Was what about? I mean, you have so many sites, and obviously we can't be an expert in everything. Was there any big challenge with with that? Um, I guess that goes back to I guess the inability to build an authority site. Um, you know, if you're trying to work on twenty sites, you're really not gonna make any of them like the site in its niche. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is there just wasn't enough time in the day to, you know, to build build one of them into a, you know, a really, really big authority site just because, you know, you're essentially dividing your time between 20 of them. So. Do you pick any of them because of you have a passion for one or is it strictly just mathematical? Yeah, it was pretty much mathematical. I, I guess I think you're, you're familiar with the one, uh, like the first one I got into um, where, where I liked, I liked a certain dessert, and 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 basically, initially I was getting into it because of that. Like, hey, it'd be cool if I sold this, uh, you know, for an e-commerce store. And um, but but it turned out that the, uh, you know, I was I was searching for one kind of dessert, and there was like a misspelling or a closely related 
uh, spelled term that was getting a lot more searches and ended up kind of looking into that and didn't understand why so many people were searching for the misspelling of, of the dessert I wanted to sell. And so I ended up uh, basically starting a store um, in the dessert space based on like what I thought was my, you know, would have been a passion, but it turned out to be kind of a misspelling of, of, of my passion. That was, that was the, the first or second store um, I got into. And then what about, what was another, what was a milestone that you're especially proud of that you accomplished because of what you knew with e-commerce? Um, I guess what I knew with e-commerce, um, one, one specific one was, uh, I bought a store from a guy in a package and it was not making money at the time and I didn't understand why. It was uh, getting a lot of traffic, um, looked like it was in a pretty good space and found out the reason it wasn't making money was he had, he, I don't know if he had turned everything out of stock or basically just wasn't taking orders and I, I asked him why and he said the supplier wouldn't supply him anymore. And so I started doing, you know, asked him you know, more questions, sent him more emails and said, okay, why, why wouldn't they supply you? And they had a deal where they only wanted to supply people who had brick and mortar stores, and I didn't, you know, I didn't understand it. Uh, so I called them, and you know, they, 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 you know, basically said what this guy was saying that yeah, we don't deal with anyone that's not a brick and mortar store. So I said okay. So I went back to the guy, and, and he was willing to just give it away in this package, basically for very cheap. So as I was negotiating a deal with him for it was like you know seven sites, something like that in this package. Um, I called, we called a company that, uh, in, in town that had a brick and mortar store within that space. And I, I basically, we, we said, Hey, uh, would you be willing to kind of, you know, I guess quote, quote joint venture, but not really, not really have to do anything. We just want to kind of use your storefront as like our, our base for this, for this space. And it took one phone call and they said, sure. Like they, we said, look, we're not trying to compete with you or anything like that. We just need this for a you know, to get it to get a deal, and so they said, "Sure." Um, we called the company, and, and at the same time, we were closing the deal with the guy. We said, "Hey, look, we have a joint venture with a brick and mortar store. Like, would we be able to supply you?" And they said, "Yeah." Like, you know, we they, I think they talked to a couple of their bosses, and you know, had all these discussions on it. And they said, "Yeah, you know, we could do that." And so when I closed the deal uh, with the guy, literally all we had to do is was just turn the income faucet on because now we had that deal that the guy. The guy didn't have. Um, it really didn't take a lot of work. It was just that, you know, he wasn't really thinking outside the box on it. Like, okay, here's what you need. So, you know, he just decided to shut down orders. Where we said, okay, how can we, how can we make that happen? Um, when it wasn't really that complicated. I mean, um, you know, we didn't have to build a build a brick and mortar store. We just, you know, they said we just needed the location. So we actually we actually took a product, took one or two of the products that we we bought a couple up front from them, took the products and. Took pictures of, of it in our in our you know brick and mortar store, and it was it was really joint venture store, but and we just ended up keeping uh you know keeping the product there and uh, uh yeah so they actually they even had a rep come visit and and they wanted to meet at the store and so like uh, one of my guys drove down there and met him and and, and it, was, it was it was fine it ended up working out and so um, but it was you know we took a store that was making zero and I think I don't know how many months it took but we. You know, I think there was a month where it made, you know, brought in like eight thousand or nine thousand in revenue, um, and it was it was a decent earning store, um, and it was literally just just you know once we had that deal, just turning the faucet on and letting let, letting sales come back on. So there was another niche that you were talking about that surprised me that you were in um, the organic baby furniture. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So. That was the first one. Unless um, you have like kids running around in the background that I don't see. Yeah, yeah no, no <laughs> kids. Yeah, that was uh, the other one that I started like in that in that first week. So with a dessert one, um, this one I had bought uh, on Flippa. So there was a deal. Uh, it was an organic baby furniture store, and the seller I think they wanted maybe uh, six seven grand for the site, and. It was a really good deal. Like it, I didn't make sense. I think it was making like nine hundred bucks a month at the time. So I didn't understand. Okay, why why is it so cheap? You know, is it is there something wrong? There must be something wrong with it, right? So, um, you know, so I started looking into. It. I looked at the analytics. Okay, it seems legit. Looked at their sales uh, in the back of their store. Called the seller, and 
you know, all the comments were basically like, oh, it can't be real. Like it's, it's, you know, it, they only want, you know, six grand for the buy it now. It can't be real. So all these people, instead of do, doing due diligence, were just, you know, saying it must, you know, must be something wrong with it. You know, sales are going to fall off once you buy it. Um, and I called the seller and, and just kind of did due diligence. I thought it, thought it was legit. I had no experience at the time with buying any commerce store, but, you know, just ran some math and said, this is, it seems like a no brainer, um, to do. So I told her, look, you know, like, what is it, you know, why are you trying to sell? Um, you know, what's going on? And so she said like she needed money for something else. And so I tried to solve her problem and said, look, like the auction was still set to run for another week or another month or whatever it was. So the, the bids were really low and you know, she had to buy it now up there. I said, look, are you willing to lower the buy it now? And I'll, and I'll wire you money tomorrow. And you know, she might need money fast. So she was like, okay, I'll, I'll lower it. And, and I even thought like her listing at six, six grand was extremely low. And so I got her to lower it even more because of the fact that no one was bidding because they viewed it as risky. And so she lowered the buy it. Now I bought it, wired her the money the next day and, and bought my first e-commerce store. And, uh, and so ended up with an organic baby store. And just because of the, like the inability to, 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 you know, view it past like, Hey, it might be risky to the other people. It, they, they let the price be really low. Um, and I ended up selling that recently. And I think, you know, on that four grand that I put in, I probably made back over 20 on it. Um, and it, you know, on something that's, that was pretty passive. So, um, so that was, yeah, that was the first one. And that was, uh, I know it's kind of random, random product. It's random. What was the what was the best seller in the in that uh, niche? Was there one that stands out? Um, well, I mean, we sold a lot of mattresses, like organic baby mattresses. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, we sold everything from mattresses to blankets to uh, yeah, pads, mattress pads, stuff like that. It's so, a hot topic, you know. When when it comes to the people's babies, they want to only get like the best organic, whatever yep. organic means. Yeah, it's not a bad niche. So what about um, what was more of a painful moment? Because also you're dealing with a lot. If you're, you know, it's hands free. You probably have a lot of people that you're trying to manage, right? How does that work? Uh, it w I wouldn't say I had a lot that I that I managed like on a day to day basis. Uh, we outsourced. So I outsourced most of the like any any uh, like SEO for example. Like I'd have you know, teams of guys who would, you know, either I'd buy packages from or, you know, some guys would work on certain stores. Um, but in, in terms of in-house, I didn't have a lot of guys. I mean, uh, I think I had, you know, two two or three total. Um, and it, it, most of the time was probably two. Because um, most of the outsourcing stuff was like contractor, like SEO type stuff. Um, and obviously we, you know, since we're drop shipping everything, we don't have a warehouse. We don't have... Um, you know, a lot of the hassles of if we were manufacturing products. So uh, we basically just had people doing customer service, uh, maybe maybe adding new products, dealing with the suppliers, that type of stuff. So it didn't didn't take didn't take a lot of in, like employees wise. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I ended up ended up uh, you know, spending a lot of time not not doing a lot of the day to day of the stores, but kind of managing uh, other people who were doing the day to day of the stores. Did that ever become? Like difficult if someone wasn't doing what you wanted them to do. Yeah, it was. I, I'm not. I'm not really a manager. I'm, I'm. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm not. You know, the the management stuff is not my forte, and so um, there, there definitely got to be points where, you know, I'd be. I'd feel like I was. You know, my day was made up of managing or like checking on stuff or, you know, whatever it may be, and that's not not my strength, not my interest. Like I don't wake up in the morning and like. Hey, let's go. Let's go manage something today. Um, I don't. I don't get excited about that. And so, um, yeah, it definitely got to be a point where, you know, I probably should have made a shift in the business um, earlier because it was just, you know, you you want to be working on something that number one, your you know, the majority of your work is stuff you're very good at, and number two, that you're really excited about it. And so, um, so <clears throat> there was definitely a point where it was a lot of my day was made up of. Hey, I don't. I don't really know, you know, if I'm excited about it. And you know, I know management is not my strength. Um, it's it's you know, my strength stuff was either you know, in the e-commerce space, you know, finding good deals, you know, negotiating deals, um, finding a good niche to be in. But it was not when it got to be a ton of stores uh, and, and a lot of just like kind of management of the day-to-day -day stuff. It was 
yeah, that's not that interesting to me. I'm not, I'm not really like a, yeah, management operation type. So how do you get over that? Because you're running a lot of, you know, e-commerce stores, and you, you know, you're a motivated person. You know, how do you get over? It's not always. Also, even if someone is passionate about it, sometimes they just get burnt out or tired. Yeah. How do you get over that? Um, I probably should have. So, I mean, at this point, I've sold off a number of the stores um, and, and working on a new project, uh, Ecom Lab. Um, I probably should have done that a lot sooner. Uh, I'd been considering starting Ecom Lab a while ago, um, and you know, if I had either sold off a bunch earlier and started that project or sold off a bunch earlier and focused on, you know, one specific one that I was really interested in, you know, because then it's, it's a lot easier to get up in the morning, super excited, like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to scale this, this business up, uh, make it an authority site, make it, um, you know, a really big business when you're just, you know, doing what I was doing is basically just, just math. Like all I was doing is math. And then when, when it got to be big enough, it was like, okay, now I'm not even doing math anymore. I'm, I'm managing you know what? What the math had basically put together for me was all this collection of stores. So, um, so I probably should have, you know, kind of uh, changed the model sooner. Um, either lower the number of stores, started a new project I was interested in, which I'm doing now, and or uh, lower the number of stores and focused on, you know, one or two of those stores specifically and scale them up. I mean, I don't think we mentioned this yet, but obviously. Um, you're a per, you know professional poker player. How does your professional poker playing experience play into this? Um, like well, with your mindset, because again, like you're used to kind of taking these these calculated risks. Yeah, it's just, I guess it's helped a lot in the sense that, um, like, it doesn't emotionally affect me if I if I lose money, like the deal where I spent fifteen grand and a couple months later I wasn't making much money. Um, didn't really bother me at all because I knew the risk going in, uh, and I think you know poker kind of equips you for that stuff. Like I view risk, you know, very logically. Like, okay, I'm okay with this risk uh, because I can make enough money to make it worth it. Where most people view it as emotionally and, and say, hey, I don't want to lose my money. I don't want to don't want to take this risk. It's you know, I might lose. You know, I'm, I'm just going to keep my money here in the bank or uh, you know under my pillow and just keep it safe. Where you know, the fact that they're keeping it safe guarantees them long-term failure because they're not, you know, they don't they're not taking any opportunities that would make them money. So um, I guess just you know coming from poker, <clears throat> it doesn't bother me at all. Like if I take a risk and lose money, which has happened plenty of times, um, I don't really care because I'm not. My goal isn't like whether I make money or lose money today. It's you know over the long term. Like I want to make you know money over the long term, uh, which is very easily easy if you're consistently making um you know we talk about in poker like plus ev like expected value like if, if it's a plus ev decision then most of the time just do it and and you don't have to think too deep about it um and that's like thinking logically about it where most people would be like even if the math works out they'd be too afraid to pull the trigger because like hey i don't want to lose this you know 10 grand or 20 grand or whatever it may be so they just keep it stored away where you know the fact that that's doing nothing for them and making zero for them is actually like they're they're losing like they're guaranteeing themselves to lose the game long term um, where like I don't care if I lose this today or this week or whatever um, I'm concerned with like am I making the correct decision if so then I'll do it and I don't care what the result is um, so poker kind of taught me to you know not really worry about it because it, it it doesn't matter the math works out in the long term yeah where did you get this where do you think you got your kind of entrepreneurial spirit because it seems like okay you have forever jobless the you know you have the e-commerce stores you have poker but even when you were younger you would sell baseball cards where do you think this this came from um i don't really know i mean i always liked making money uh i had a paper route when i was um like nine and so i always you know and i remember that the, the age to get a poker route was or uh not poker route, paper route was 12 and you know, but I, the guy across the street had the paper and he was quitting, and I found out he made like fifty bucks a week, and I was like, "Wow, that's a lot of money," you know, like to a nine year old. And so I really wanted that that job, and so uh, I had my mom call the paper and basically see if like we could put a root in her name, and I would do it. And so, and the guy, the manager came over, and met with me, and I was like, you know, hey, I'll, you know, I'll do a good job and whatever, you know, nine year old me trying to trying to get the you know get the deal, and I got it, and I just remember always liking money um you know making money and and so 
when I got into baseball cards, I think I kind of just fell into that and, and, and figured, hey, you know, this, this whole kind of making money on your own thing is pretty nice. Um, just started, I think I initially got into it because I um, had a bunch of cards that I wanted to get rid of and you know, I, got, I collected cards as a kid and just tried to, you know, decide to sell some off and somebody bought them from me. And then I remember uh, just randomly there was a collection for sale in the paper like a couple weeks later and I, and I saw it and at the time I was still kind of interested in, in collecting cards but you know, I was more interested in basketball. <clears throat> and so I said, so I contacted the guy who bought my, bought my other cards, my, my baseball and football cards. I said, hey, you know, would you be interested in this collection? There's a collection for sale. I was, I was thinking about you know, buying, buying the collection but just, just keep it in the basketball stuff. And so um, my first, I guess my first real business deal in the cards was uh, he agreed and he agreed on a price. And so he paid me, it was like twice as much, two to three times as much, I think it was just twice as much for um, for the baseball and football as I paid for the entire thing. And huh. so it was only I was only giving him like two thirds of the collection, but he paid me double. Um, and I get to keep all the all the basketball cards. And I was like, wait a minute, like that was kinda easy and I didn't I didn't uh I think, you know, my dad lent me like, you know, seven hundred bucks of the time to, to, to go buy it from the guy and then the guy sent me the sent me the check, but uh I just got really interested. And then after that, I found out like I didn't even need to put up money sometimes. So what I would do is I'd do something similar where I'd find a deal and I'd find somebody else who wanted it. And I would say, hey, do you want to buy this deal? And I didn't even own it yet, but somebody else was selling it. And so somebody would send me money and then I'd buy somebody else's collection for less and I would send them the collection. Um, so that's kind of how I got started. And it was very, um, you know, I was essentially just arbitraging just right. brand sports deals and collections and it was uh you know it's that's why i think it's funny when a lot of people like complain like hey i don't have money to get started and all this i mean it, you know it was just i was just a you know 17 year old just kind of looking on ebay at different collections and stuff like that and just uh i mean it, I, I just got me really interested in like saying wait a minute like if you just if you just think a little bit outside the box you don't i don't need to go work you know go go mow lawns for people all summer or go go do whatever i can just you know hang out at my house and <laughs> kind of play basketball and you know play with sports cards all day so you've always been arbitraging so where did you get that from like was it something your parents you know talked to you about were they you know business owners How, where did you get that from um i i honestly don't know um my parents weren't entrepreneurs um you know my, my dad's in business so I, I i think i got interested in um i guess hearing him talk about business but he wasn't he you know he, he worked uh in management um for company, so I, I wasn't surrounded by entrepreneurs or anything hmm. like that. It was just, I don't know. It, it just always made logical sense to me. Like, wait a minute, why would I, why would I work for somebody else when I can make more money on my own? Like, not you know, you know, there's a ceiling to how much I can make working for somebody else, and there, there wasn't on my own. Plus, like, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to wake up early. I didn't have to hmm. take orders from anybody else. And uh, you know, I guess I was always the kind of kid where if my teacher said something, like. I didn't. I didn't necessarily agree, and like I'd be glad to tell them I didn't agree with it. Um, where I don't know why, you know, why I was wired that way, but that yeah. kind of came into play as as an entrepreneur. Like I didn't understand like why I would go get a job for somebody um, when I could just make money on my own. Yeah. Uh, just never, just never made, just never added up to me. Yeah, yes. I'm just curious because that's not like the typical way people think, and so I'm wondering if some someone or something influenced you early on. What is a piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor? that's been valuable or, or that you would give to someone else? Um, yeah, I don't know where I heard it, but I, I know this is like, I say this all the time to people, um, is uh, take advice from those you aspire to be like and ignore mm -hmm. everyone else. Um, I think, you know, most aspiring entrepreneurs who get into business <clears throat> or are trying to get into business, they take advice from like anybody who will give it to them and it's just, a lot of times it's really bad advice. So, you know, if you look at kind of the, the, the internet marketing and blogging landscape, you know, a lot of those guys are making money by pitching, you know, info products and just like random courses and, and all that stuff. But um, they don't really do their due diligence and look at the fact that, like, wait a minute, like, okay, let's let's look at how this guy makes money. Like, he's, you know, some of those guys have never made money building a business, but they make money like selling make money products and, and things like that. And a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs are so excited to, you know, get started in business. They want to learn, and you know, they think this guy's got the answer. This guy's got the answer, and they don't do the research to find out. Wait a minute, like. This guy's never actually made money, um, but they're 
you're taking that advice. And so, you know, just really, if you want to go make, you know, six figures a year or seven figures a year or whatever it is, uh, you've got to find a guy who's, who's done that already, like in, in the space you want to go into. So, you know, if you're trying to be a, you know, a professional athlete, for example, you don't go, you know, hire a kid who, you know, couldn't make his high school team to, to teach, you how, teach you how to be a pro, you know, baseball player or whatever. But that's kind of how it works in the make money world is like, the equivalent of that is like this guy didn't make it in business, so he sells like make money products instead. Um, they have to have been there in some degree um, that that you want to get to, and so that's like the biggest trap I see people get into. And you see it on, on like forums and blogs all the time. Is a lot of people are essentially just regurgitating things they heard from like you know warrior forum or whatever, and it's and it's like incorrect information. Um, but the fact that so many people are saying it, it just kind of like compounds, and then there's like more info marketers and there's more like bloggers like saying the same thing and it's like it's actually incorrect um and a lot of things you know if you go to a blog you, you can you can look at a post and be like this is actually like incorrect information or it's like suboptimal like it's suboptimal strategy but then there's so many of them out there that a lot of the aspiring entrepreneurs are getting in the game and like following that advice so then they're just like going down a path that they're going to waste a lot of years because they didn't listen to the right people when they started out so who are you listening to or following early on um, early on, uh, basically I, w- I would go read like rich dad forums all the time. And it was, you know, and, and I was the same way. I, did, I had no idea what to do, who to follow. Um, so I, w- I was listening to a lot of guys pitching MLMs and, you know, all sorts of affiliate marketing stuff. I had no idea. Um, but you know, one guy, uh, for example, was MJ DeMarco, um, who wrote Millionaire Fastlane is he was over there. You know, this is years ago. I mean, I don't know, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, however long it was. And um, he was somebody that I think, you know, for whatever reason, I, you know, I was able to tell, like, wait a minute, okay, this guy seems to know what he's talking about, uh, and he's not pitching me anything, like, which is which was weird at the time because everybody on Rich Dad at the time was like, here's this advice. By the way, like, call me if you want to join this company. You know, and, and it was it was all MLM stuff at the time, and um, and it was funny. I think I think guys like MJ would be in there, you know. Like essentially ripping, you know, a lot of the other guys, like, uh, and 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 giving really good information. Um, and so he, uh, you know, he was somebody that I think has always put out pretty good information on uh, kind of make money and entrepreneurship. Um, I think he does a really good job of it. Uh, another guy is, you know, who I listen to uh, is one of the few blogs I read is uh, Neil Patel. Um, I think he he puts out really good information. Um, yeah, I think those are a couple guys that. You know, there's there's pretty much nothing I disagree with that those guys say. Where like a lot of the other blogs, I mean, uh, and 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 kind of info marketing stuff out there, it's I don't find a lot of stuff that I that I'm like, yeah, you should definitely listen to this guy. Um, but I think both of those guys are pretty solid guys to to follow. Yeah, that's good. Now I have one last question for you, <laughs> Billy. But before I ask it, I want you to tell us about what's going on now, what you're excited about, about Ecom Lab. Yeah. Um, so I'm starting, so Ecom Lab, I've been thinking about starting it for, I guess, the last year or two, but uh, so Ecom Lab is an e-commerce training site. So it's basically um, video-based training for, you know, anything to do with starting an e-commerce store, uh, making a current e-commerce store more profitable, and it's basically... You know, it's what I would have wanted when I was starting out, and I didn't know, you know, how to find all the answers. And I remember kind of, you know, just googling around, and like, <clears throat> I had a buddy who was in e-commerce. I got kind of lucky that I could call him and be like, "Hey, I have no, I, I have no idea how to do this. How do I, how do I, uh, you know, whatever it was, how do I get traffic to my site, or you know, what, what niche should I go into? I had no idea about anything, and uh, you know, but a lot of people didn't have that. Even though I had a buddy to call, there were still plenty of times where you know, I either felt like I was bugging him because I, you know call them all the time for super basic stuff or, or, uh, you know, it was just something that, you know, he hadn't dealt with or whatever it may have been, but there was just not a place, there's not a go-to place for e-commerce, uh, you know, how to make money in e-commerce stores. And, you know, so my goal with, uh, Ecom Lab is basically to put all the information in one place. So if you needed an answer, you know, you didn't have to leave the site. Cause I remember I'd be on like, you know, one, one forum, like looking for some information that I'd, be on an SEO forum, like trying to okay, this is how I get traffic, and then I'd be you know googling around or like searching YouTube, and you know I'd have like 17 windows open, like trying to find you know a couple answers, and it and it didn't make any sense, and I was wasting a lot of time, and so you know once I got into it, 
I would get a lot of questions and people would say, you know, how did you get, you know, how do you, how do you buy all these stores? How do you start all these stores? And, and it was hard to give an answer. You know, I'd have to give, you know, if they really wanted to know, I mean, I could sit down with them for 10 hours and, and break it out, but it wasn't really feasible to do. Um, and so, um, you know, and I was on the fence for a while and I actually put a post out on forever jobless, um, you know, last year in, in August, I think it was, and it was just kind of a couple e-commerce stories, like some things I learned, and uh, I got like a hundred emails or something from that one post. My blog was like three weeks old, and so it, you know, I didn't have tons of subscribers or anything at that point, and uh, and so I was like, okay, this is like clearly I have known this is a need because I've been in it, um, and it's uh, it's clearly a, a big need, and so um, rather than you know, I didn't have time to you know just blog about or answer emails all day about like answering everyone's questions on everything and so uh you know figured okay like I'll I'll create some sort of service where make it easier for people and, and uh you know there's a big there's a big problem there's a big gap in e-commerce and the fact that you know if you want to do this you know by yourself right now and, and you're starting out and you don't know what to do you can either figure it out all, all on your own which takes tons of time like I know cuz I've been there and it took me tons of time even though I had a friend to call um all the time and so or you can hire an agency and pay them, you know, a bunch of money just to do it all for you. But the problem is, like, most people don't have a bunch of money to spend when they're starting out. Actually, e-commerce stores, one of the benefits is it doesn't really take a lot of money to start with. And so um, just hiring an agency to, to do everything for you kind of kills the, kills the you know, low-cost uh, low option of e-commerce. And so basically the goal was um, we want to make it easy for people to learn, uh, make it affordable, and just, you know, I just wanted to make something where if I could go back in time and I had this, just would have made my life so much easier. And that's, um, I think, what makes a good business. Um, and so, yeah, like I'm waking up every day excited to work on it right now, and, and it's very, uh, yeah, very exciting. I think it's, I think it's a tough, um, it's a relatively tough niche to to break into from that side of the business in terms of like education for e-commerce because of the fact that. It's not really people don't know they need to be educated on it. So essentially, we have to educate them that they need education <laughs> before we can, you know, get customers. I think, um, and so it's actually a little bit of a tough niche to get into. But I think, you know, we're we're adding so much value. I mean, we're uh, and I've talked to you about it. We're bringing on, you know, it's not me teaching uh, a bunch of e-commerce stuff. You know, there's some areas where I'm very good at, but then there's other areas where I'm not an expert at. And so you know, I'm bringing a lot of people in who have experience in areas I don't. So if it's uh, you know, maybe you know somebody has experience drop shipping uh, or not drop shipping, but outsourcing to China. <clears throat> you know, somebody's got you know, huge PPC experience. Somebody's got um, you know very good at uh, conversion optimization. So we're bringing all these people to one place so that you know somebody doesn't have to say, okay, so you know, okay, you know one thing, but then I have to go to, like five or six other e-commerce training sites for all this other stuff. And so uh, we're just making it super simple, like whatever they need an answer on. You know, we're putting out new videos every single week. I think we're starting with uh, starting with like three videos every every week. We may expand that. Um, so every week they're getting new information and just trying to make their lives a lot easier with uh, running the stores. Yeah. Well, I've no doubt it will be great because I mean, you mastered the poker thing, so this is going to be much uh, much similar. What's the so people can check it out? What's the um, domain? Yeah, it's uh, ecomlab.com. Is it two M's? Uh, no, just one M. One M. And that kind of brings me to my final question, which is, that's a great domain. How did you get it? So, yeah, there's a little little bit of a funny story to this. Um, this was one of the first, so I was looking around for, it's funny, naming naming your, your business is like one of the hardest parts, right? Like, it's like, I feel like I spent forever on that, and it's, uh should be, you know, just a, just a simple, okay, let's just pick a na- do- na- domain. Um, <clears throat> but, uh so I looked at, I was looking around for a bunch of domains, found Ecom Lab, and I said, okay, I really like this one. Um, you know, thought about it for a little more, thought about it for a little more, didn't know if I liked it, but I wrote the guys who who owned it, and, you know, it's one of those companies that just kind of domain squat on, you know, thousands and thousands of names, and um, and, and they wrote back, and, and they were real jerks, like, I, it was the weirdest response ever to, like, somebody who's trying to buy something from you, and and... It was basically like, hey, I'm interested in your, your domain, um, and and you always write them. Don't write them from your, you know, an email that would show them that you have money to buy it. So you write them from like a Yahoo account or something. And so I wrote them from like a ya- random Yahoo account and said, hey, I, I just don't don't have a lot of money that I want to spend on this. Um, 
So, and I think they had that listed for like 700 bucks. I said, you know, could you do, you know, I listed like a real low price, just hoping they, you know, come down and meet me somewhere. And, you know, they came back and essentially called me like an idiot. Uh, they said it was real funny. It was like the weirdest customer service response ever. Um, and, and it was funny because I had my other guys write, you know, write them later to see if they'd do something. And they wrote the same response. Like they basically like insult you. It was just kind of, kind of funny, but, uh, but they like they basically told me I was an idiot and said that was stupid and they they had it for a long time and they want to make money on it whatever it was but it's just really funny email that they write and then so so whatever I kept looking around for a domain I wasn't sure if I wanted that one anyways um, just you know looking for all these domains and it's funny that all the domains we would look at you know it's a very specific niche right e-commerce training so there's you know all these domains that people are squatting on when I'd approach them and, and try and buy it. I thought they'd be jumping for joy that like finally someone came for this domain that you know probably no one has approached them about. Um, so there was a lot of random, you know, five or six random domains that I was actually more interested in an ecom lab. And I try and buy them, and people were like, "No, you know, we're hanging on to it." And I'm, you know, I'm thinking this is you know, it's kind of crazy. Like there's not going to be another guy probably starting an e-commerce you know, training related business come specifically to you. But so we couldn't get any of the other domains that I really wanted. And so <laughs> I went back to to ecom lab. And they had jacked the price up on it. So this domain that they couldn't have, they couldn't sell for a year, like they'd been sitting on this forever, it didn't sell. And so they, they jacked it up. And so one of my guys wrote them and said, "Hey, I think I saw this listed lower." And and basically, like I'm pretty sure that they had jacked it up because they because they received interest. And so instead of you know just keeping their price, they saw an interest and just jacked the price up. And so they, I think they put it to like. Instead of, instead of six hundred or seven hundred, it was like uh, thirteen hundred or something, and so, um, so basically they close to doubled, doubled the site. Ended up we ended up buying it for like twelve hundred or thirteen hundred bucks because we couldn't get any, any of the other stuff we wanted. And uh, yeah, they just uh, yeah, it's just just a hustle these guys, the, the domain squatters. So uh, so yeah, ended up having to pay more since we didn't just buy it buy it the first time, but. That's a good story. The lesson learned is just be a jerk when you respond to people's email or what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, actually, you know, I started thinking about it and obviously there's the there's a side of me that was like, oh, you know, what jerks, like that's 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 stupid that they do that because, you know, now I'm not going to buy it. But then I couldn't find anything else and I go back and buy it and I started thinking about it, right? And it's like, you know, these guys probably don't get approached for a domain like that, you know, very much at all. And so, like, I started thinking about it like, yeah, it's not the, you know, maybe not the most... I don't know, ethical is, I guess it's not unethical. Like it's their domain. They can price it for whatever they want, but it's, I started thinking about it from a mathematical perspective and it's, it, it might not be very, very bad to do what they did because, you know, if they get a random inquiry on a domain like that, um, it's a you know relatively specific domain. Uh, you know, they, you know, if, if they, I tried to think about it in terms of EV, if they close to double the price on it, you know, as long as I don't not buy it, you know, less than, Fifty percent of the time, they actually make money on on jacking the price on me. So um, I I don't know if they did it, you know, mathematically because of that, or they just you know felt like bumping the price. I have no idea, but you know, I don't know if it's a I don't know if it's a good or bad strategy. It's kind of, it was kind of interesting though. Well, it was good for them in that situation, I guess. It's good for them. Yes. Yeah, they made some more money yeah. off me. But you'll get the last laugh with the uh, e-commerce store. But Billy, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise. Um, you know, we could use that stuff for any site. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on.